Love is patient, man. Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz pianist Johannes Wallmann. He was born in Germany and lived there for 12 years before moving and being raised on Canada's Vancouver Island. He would go on to study at the Berklee College of Music and New York University. He has seven critically acclaimed CDs as a leader, including his latest that he is promoting these days, 2018 CD, Love Wins. He's performed with jazz luminaries, traveled the globe, he teaches, and he has great stories. So please get to know him and dig this interview, my friends. Hey, thanks for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz, man. I appreciate it. Uh, Thank you for um, taking time to talk with me. You bet. So let's hop right in here and talk about your latest CD, Love Wins. Talk to me about this project and how you feel about it. <laughs> well, I'm I'm really uh, I'm, I'm really excited about it. I think it's a uh, it's something that's uh, kind of a unique unique thing out there. I think the music uh, uh, came out beautifully. Uh, when I first set out to do this, I was a little you know um, apprehensive about um, you know is it possible to uh, um, you know to make an album up with a with a social message that. Um, an advocacy message that uh, where the the message doesn't diminish the music, or where the music doesn't isn't an uh, you know the message isn't an add on to the music or something, but the two things uh, strengthen each other, and uh, you know and, and, uh, the, and the whole of the parts is is is, is greater than, than than the sum of the parts, and and I think it succeeded. I'm, I'm you know it's, I sort of took a chance with it, and I'm glad uh, to see that I think it worked out. Talk to me about your life. You were born in Germany and raised on Vancouver Island. Talk to me about your childhood and how you got to a jazz point in your life. I lived in Germany until I was 12. Uh, my parents you know, uh, divorced and, uh, and and remarried. And I've been playing music since really before I can remember. My uh, parents enrolled me in early childhood education, uh, in music education, uh, program and uh, so some of my earliest memories are just uh, uh, you know banging around at xylophones and uh, drawing drawing notes and uh, that, that sort of stuff. And but it was you know I was classically based. I wanted to play the trombone when I was really little, and uh, but I was way too too small to hold one. And uh, so like so many kids, I started on recorder. Didn't really care for that. And, uh, and the next step was uh, was the piano, and I really took to that. Played test for piano uh, really until college. And liked it, didn't love it, but but really enjoyed it. Didn't always enjoy the practice time, and uh, yeah, so I always had a deal with my mom that uh, if I practice half an hour, I could then go and play soccer, and that that was my real passion. Fast forward three years uh, when I was uh, uh, when I moved to Canada at uh, with my mom at age twelve. Um, I was waiting for a music lesson. Um, thought maybe uh, a little bit later than that. I was waiting for a music lesson at the local um, community music school, which was at the local college, and there's some college kids there who, um, uh, you know, with a boombox, and um, a couple of them were playing music for each other, and and it sounded incredible. And I'd never heard anything, like, I'd never consciously heard anything like that. My parents listened to a lot of classical music. My friends in Germany listened to mostly British pop music. I never heard anything like this before, and it was like otherworldly, and it was really cool, and an amazing groove, and I just loved it. And so I got up the nerve to ask these college kids who are much older, like, you know, from the perspective of a young teenager, yeah, what is that? And then he said, man, it's Miles Davis. I'm like, okay. So um, I didn't ask anything else. They seemed a little too cool for me, but uh, um, then uh, yeah, I had my mom drive me to the record store the next day, and... Uh, uh, looked for Miles Davis, found, you know, was told to look in the jazz section and, uh, and found that Miles actually had a lot of albums out. So I picked two that had really cool looking covers, um, uh, Milestones and Tutu. Tutu had just come out, so, um, you know, they were promoting that and Milestones, of course, you know, one of the classics. And, uh, took him home, started listening, loved it and, uh, yeah. caught the bug and, uh, Pretty, you know, pretty much right away, kind of figured out, man, this is the music I really want to play. This is, and pretty, pretty figured out this is what I want to do with my life. Right on. Well, so you go to the Berkeley College of Music and New York University. Mm-hmm. Tell me what you learned in a formal collegiate environment that helped you as a musician. It's a great place to learn, you know, the conventions of the music. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching it now, and uh, so I'm on the other side of it. And, and really, um, you know, what we try to... Um, I teach our students what I learned in, in those situations, which is, um, 
you know, what is what, what are the common practices in the music, and you know, what have um, the people whose music we love, how how did they create that music? Yeah. So essentially, um, you know, it's, um, I'm, sometimes we overuse the analogy, but it is a really good one. It's like learning to speak. You know, to speak a language, you have to learn the vocabulary, you have to learn the grammar, you have to learn the idioms, and all that. And uh, you know, as you um, um, as you can hear from talking with me, uh, I still have a bit of a German accent uh, all these years later. And I never really cared about that because I figured people could understand me just fine. But I always kind of thought, like, you know, when I play jazz, I don't want to sound like I'm playing jazz with an accent. I don't want to sound like I'm I didn't completely master this language. Growing up in a classical household, coming coming to this music uh, as a kid, but you know, as, as, as an older kid, um, you know, and uh, I, I think yeah, college, college helped me just uh, get a really solid technical grounding of, of the you know, of the grammar, of the vocabulary, the idioms of, of, of this music, and and, I, and it, it's an opportunity for me to meet a lot of other fabulous musicians, just you know, great players who are inspiring and. Uh, yeah, um, so it's very much a, a social and community uh, kind of experience as well. So when you arrived in New York City in 1995, was it just amazing to be a part of that cauldron of jazz? It was, it was incredible. You know, New York is the place where everybody is. And uh, um, uh, pretty shortly after, get, after getting there, um, you know, I'd, make, I'd met friends with a guitarist and uh, who was making his first record, and you know, it was just an independent release. Yeah, he, he was a uh, um, uh, he was a big Pat Metheny. Um, he, he was really influenced and inspired by Pat Metheny, and uh, so um, he managed to get uh, Danny Gottlieb, the drummer in the original Pat Metheny group, to um, yeah uh, to play on his album. And I was playing on his album as well. And I remember being in the recording studio. And uh, you know, the nice thing about uh, uh, my experience at Berkeley is that I was friends with a lot of students studying. Um, uh, music production and engineering, i.e., yeah, music recording technology. So I'd spent a ton of time in the studio already, and I was re- really comfortable with that. And this is the first time I was getting paid to make a, uh, uh, I was getting paid to make a, to be in the studio and make a recording. So I'm, I'm used to that. Everything, everything is fine. But then as we're playing the first tune, and I'm just playing, and I have my eyes sort of half closed, suddenly, and yeah, you know, I'm kind of thinking like, man, that drummer sounds just like Danny Gottlieb, because you know, I grew up with all the early Machine albums too. And I opened my eyes, and there's Danny Gottlieb playing, <laughs> you know, in the booth next to me. Just having, yeah, and then I, and then yeah, at the end of the day, I kind of thought about that some more, and I realized I was in the right place because that wouldn't have happened to me anywhere else as quickly, and it just kept happening. I kept, you know, hearing all these, like, former idols of mine, uh, you know, um, you know, sometimes getting to play with them, playing with them at jam sessions, uh, meeting them, and... And so on, and um, and at the same time, also knowing that I was kind of having those same interactions with people who would go on to be the people whose records everybody was buying, and you know, who make those kind of impressions, and the next generation of musicians. It was a magical place. Absolutely. So, what have you learned from being around the big shots? Well, like, you know, Gary Bartz and and Ralph Alessi and and Ingrid Jensen. There's been so many people that you played with. What do you learn from those that have been around for a long time and have been on many stages? They're very serious about what 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 they do. Um, you know, that's um, they've this has been what they've devoted their lives to, and they don't mess around. Um, you know, like pre- pretty much everybody in this uh, uh, in, in this in this music has uh, has sort of an easygoing quality to them that I think you have to have as an improviser. You have to be able to relate to things in the moment and. Uh, um, but uh, you know what? What all? Of, but they're all incredibly dedicated to to the art and the craft of of, of, of what what they do, and that's just inspiring to see you know, to see somebody like uh, you know. You mentioned Ingrid. I think um, uh, you know she's she's been a fabulous musician for several decades now, and and yet she sounds better than ever. Um, you know, I mean, she, she keeps keeps growing and 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 evolving and. Uh, as, as an artist and deep, deepening what she does, and yeah, and that's true for all, you know, for all of those people, and uh, that's inspiring. That's um, that's who you want to be around, you know, the best. Absolutely. At this point, right now, you have seven albums. You've been all over the place, all over the world, and you play with a lot of people. How do you feel about your career? Are you happy? I, I'm loving it. I'm super happy. It's a uh, 
you know, I realized relatively early on in my career that um, an opportunity to uh, do some college travel teaching at at an age that uh, was a little bit younger than when most people get into it, and uh, and and I realized that I really enjoyed that too. Now, I, I, I didn't know I was it wasn't part of the original plan, but I but I loved it. I just really. Uh, you know, music for me is absolutely, it's 100% about connecting with people. And, uh, and so is teaching. And so they're very similar in that sense. And they both, uh, you know, there's an art and a craft to both. There's improvisation in both. And, and so, but from the very beginning, I've been trying to figure out how to pursue being great at both things and how to balance the time commitments that are inherent to both. And, uh, and at various times, uh, you know, one is kind of taking too much time away from from the other, and for me that hasn't that hasn't worked well. And I'm now in a position where I get to do both things, uh, I, you know, to, to, to devote sort of similar amounts of time to both. And you know, I've, I have a job, um, I've, I've the teaching position that very much um, uh, wants and supports me, and being active as a uh, as, as as an artist. You know, and I'm in a position where I'm I'm able to do that, despite the fact of you know being in a uh, being in a smaller city. Not being able to, um, uh, you know, to tour as much during, you know, tour much during the, re- you know, during the regular school year. I feel like I have enough connections and uh, uh, enough of a um, career background that I'm able to, um, you know, keep making excellent music and having people want to play, play and work with me. So it feels great. Right on. So why do you love jazz? <laughs> well, I, there's three things actually. It's the the groove. You know, it's music that makes you want to move and uh, started out as dance music and I think um, all, all the jazz that I that I really love um, you know I love all kinds of experimental things that may move us in different directions find that really interesting but the thing the things that I really love are the things that make me want to tap my feet in some way or another and uh, I love the complexity of the music I think it's music for for the feet and uh, but also for the for the mind, and uh, it's music that rewards a second listening and, and a fifth and a tenth listening, and music to keep discovering new things. And and then and then finally, the thing that's become more and more important to me, um, and I think really relates to my instrument too, the role of the piano, is the conversation. Is uh, that it's music to have a uh, word. The players get to have musical conversations with each other. Um, all the time, and you never know where that conversation is going to go. Um, a, uh, uh, you know, a, a friend of mine um, mentioned that he doesn't. Uh, a, a great musician uh, mentioned that he doesn't really like saying with people who um, come into the music with an agenda, uh, meaning who already know what they want to say before they play it. And um, and I to- and I totally relate to that. Um, you, you know, the composition gives us the framework that we operate in. But within that framework, I'd like I'd love to be able. I want to be as open as possible to whatever the next thing is that's that's going to happen. And I love playing with musicians that approach the music that way. So let me ask you this: Everyone has a perception of you, your family, your friends, your fans, your students. That you're the one that's running your show. Who do you think you are? <laughs> I'm not sure how to answer. I'm a, I'm I'm just kind of having. I'm somebody who's pursuing. Um, I'm pursuing my dream, and uh, uh, you know, I've, I have this amazing life where I get to do things that I'm really passionate about. Play, play great music. Um, also live. A, I also, yeah, you know, actually, I've built a really uh, wonderful life. For you know, for myself and my family and. Uh, uh, live in a beautiful place, and I hope to do all of those things in a way that um, is you know, respectful of um, uh, all the other people in my life and uh, contributes to uh, building a great community. Beautiful. That's a great way to wrap everything up. Hey, thank you for taking a little time out for Neon Jazz. Thank you for the music, and, and good luck, man. Uh, thank you very much. I, I, I appreciate the interest, and uh, thanks for talking with me. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview. We give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Germany, Boston, Kansas City, and spots all over the globe, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Johannes for his time, his stories, and his music. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends.
Neon Jazz.